I was in Puerto Rico a little while back and Peter Schiff invited me over to his house and we were just amazed at how we are exactly on the same page when it comes to everything economically. <laughs> and uh, so he just made a trip out to California near my offices and we decided we'd get together and uh, discuss some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, w on your travels lately, Peter, you were just at a show, you were speaking. Where were you at? I was in Las Vegas. You know, it's great yeah. to see you yeah. again, Mike. And, you know, I was speaking to a very mainstream audience of uh, hedge fund managers uh, at an annual conference there. And, you know, what was really interesting is even though the audience was, as I said, very mainstream, and I was on a panel with a lot of very high-profile mainstream individuals, the only person that really got applause was me. Uh, I also got some laughs because I told a few jokes, but I think people really got what I was saying. And I had maybe 50 or 100 people come up to me afterwards and shake my hand, uh, you know, really appreciate uh, the candor with which I spoke, and I really agree with what you had to say. And I was saying some things that uh, the mainstream really never hears about the real problems in the U.S. economy, and I blamed it all on the Fed. Everybody else was a cheerleader there for the Fed. In fact, Ben Bernanke spoke at the same event as me, and he was introduced as being the savior of the U.S. economy, and I think he damned it. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. I saw you had your picture taken with him, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. we were at a cocktail party uh, <laughs> following the event, and yeah. I thought people would get the irony of the juxtaposition between the two of us, yeah. uh, you know, kind of uh, having a glass of drink. Uh. I think that um, uh, he and Greenspan have ab absolutely destroyed America. People don't realize what is coming from the stored up energy from the manipulations that they yeah. did. And in speaking economy. to him, and it was really the first chance I had to really have a conversation uh, with, with Ben Bernanke, and in speaking to him, I really got the sense that he has no idea uh, of the Fed's culpability uh, in the housing bubble or the ensuing financial crisis. He really doesn't know, uh, and he denies that the Fed had anything to do with that, that it was maybe pure happenstance or coincidence that we had a housing bubble and these very low interest rates. And, and because Ben Bernanke still doesn't get the connection between the Fed's mistakes of the past and the last crisis, he certainly doesn't understand the coming crisis, which is going to be far worse because the f mistakes the Federal Reserve made in the aftermath of that crisis are far worse than the ones and far bigger than the ones that caused it. Right, right, yeah. Uh, ben Bernanke's overreaction was far bigger than Greenspan's overreaction to the NASDAQ. And, and, and as yeah. a result, the crisis that's in our future, unfortunately, is going to be far larger mm -hmm. than the one that we just experienced. Okay. I've, uh, I wanted to show you a couple things because I have a feeling that you and I will be exactly on the same page here. You know how indicators, there's all these different uh, factors in the economy, and uh, they'll be going up at different rates, and then suddenly one or two indicators start to point down when you're near a top, mm -hmm. and then yeah. more of them start to point down, and then things roll over, and then there's a crash, and everybody uh, thinks that nobody saw it coming. But there's a few people that are watching this stuff that, that well, do that's, see Well, that's exactly what they said about the last crash, that nobody yeah. could have possibly predicted this, right. except there were people who did predict it, but you people ignored that, them. You predicted that we yes. were in a real estate bubble. I predicted that we were in a real estate bubble. There's, there's, uh, uh, yeah. And there's Ben just Bernanke a few. denied there was a real estate bubble. Right. Even after it burst, he still couldn't figure it out. Yeah, and what amazes me is uh, people like Bernanke are taken seriously still, and the people that did predict it uh, are dismissed as lunatics half the time. <laughs> it really burns me up. Uh, but <clears throat> this is uh, manufacturing new orders for consumer goods. And uh, this is from the Fed's website. Mm -hmm. And you can see this big plunge that it took in 2008. Mm -hmm. And there's the, a big plunge that's happening right now that yeah. suggests to me if people aren't ordering new goods, I, I, th it feels like this could be that this summer maybe. Well, or remember, something. the air is coming out of the bubble because the Fed halted or paused its quantitative easing program. Most people yeah. think they ended it, but I think it's just a pause because now everybody expects the Fed to raise interest rates because they think the, the recovery finally has enough traction that it no longer needs the emergency life support of 0%, yet your chart is showing, and a lot of other economic indicators are showing, that the economy has already rolled over and is rapidly headed back to recession. Right, so even they can't the, raise interest Yeah, rates, even though the right? Fed hasn't raised them yet. All they've done is talk about raising them in the future, and we're already rolling over back into recession. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I believe that the Fed is going to have to do another round of quantitative easing, that they're not going to raise rates, and that's going to be 
you know, a shocker. It's going to send shockwaves throughout the currency markets and the, and the bond markets because everybody expects the Fed to raise rates. And when they don't do it because the economy is too fragile, because it's just a bubble, not a legitimate recovery, then people are now going to have to second guess their idea that what the Fed did worked. Instead of calling a right. Ben Bernanke a hero, uh, a lot more people are going to say, wait a minute, he, didn't, he, he, he wasn't a hero. Uh, what he did wasn't heroic. He took the coward's way out because all he did was exacerbate the problems to, to, uh, uh, to postpone the day of reckoning. Yeah, the derivatives uh, are bigger instead of smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that was put in place mm -hmm. to create that bubble that then popped, the too big to fail banks are all bigger. Nothing's been addressed, right? No, all the, those banks are now bigger than ever. Yeah. And if, they, if it was going to be a problem to let them fail in 2008, it's going to be a much bigger problem to let them fail in 2016. Yeah. So the, the government has to do whatever it can, unfortunately, uh, to keep the bubble from popping. And I think the air is already coming out even without a rate hike. But and so do I. Yeah. You know, but more importantly, see, the, the reason that he's been able to look like he's succeeded is because of the illusion that it's all temporary. Everybody believes that the Fed can normalize rates, shrink their balance sheet, but when they realize that they can't do that, that they've been lied to, mm -hmm. right, then this is going to be a major event for the currency markets and the financial markets uh, when people come to terms with the predicament that we're in, right, that it's QE infinity, that rates have to stay at zero in perpetuity because the debt is now so enormous that even the slightest increase in interest rates would collapse the system because there's just so much debt. I, I agree. I don't think that they can uh, raise interest rates. The next thing here is uh, rejection of credit applications. <laughs> and I wasn't following this chart before. I just saw it in somebody's newsletter. I think this is a zero hedge maybe. But, um, you know, this is the crisis of 08. And look at what happened in March for credit application rejections. Yeah. So there's something happening in the economy. One of it is the, the big transformation from full-time employment to part-time jobs. Everybody points to all the jobs that are being created and the low unemployment rate. But the problem is the unemployment rate dropped not because people found jobs, but because A, they stopped looking, or B, they settled for a part-time job. Uh -huh. uh, so when people who used to have full-time jobs now have part-time jobs, they don't have the income to get the credit right. that they so need. So they apply for a loan and it gets rejected. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you have uh, home ownership rates now at almost 30 year lows, right. yet rents are rising. I mean, now you have a record number, 50% of people, or excuse me, 25% of people who are renting now devote half their income to pay their housing costs. That's you know, never happened before. You have hardly anything left over right. for food or uh, other expenditures that you have. And people are loaded up with, with, with student loans. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of these college grads now have student loans, yeah. and all they can get is minimum wage jobs. And a lot of them are just part-time. So people are trying to get by. In fact, a lot of people are actually enrolling in college now, not because they want the education, because they need the loans. They just want to get the money so they can pay their utility bills. They don't even care. And a lot of our college grads, when they graduate with lots of debt, they can't find jobs. So they go to grad school to get a master's degree. Now they have even more debt, but they still can't get a job. Right, right. Yeah, um, the uh, big debt that has uh, um, been plaguing us lately, the growth in debt, a lot of it is in student loans and, and auto loans. Uh, there's yeah, subprime auto loans now. Yeah, Can't you know, as if the government didn't learn their lesson right. from the housing bubble, they decided to create a, a auto bubble. Because, right. you know, when the governments, when GM and, and, and Chrysler went bankrupt, the government also acquired their financing divisions, mm -hmm. and they still own them. So the government, after they bailed out these companies, they certainly didn't want them to fail again. They wanted to make it look like the bailout was a good idea. So they wanted to revive their profits by making it possible for just about anybody uh, to buy a car. And so a lot of people have been able to buy cars with zero down, and they've been stretching out their payments so that now people are getting six and seven year auto loans. Right, the seven year auto loan. But Your the problem car, is, you know. Only lasts maybe that long. Well, the so warranty only no lasts for ever. four years, four or five yeah. years tops. And when these cars come out of warranty, try to have it repaired. You know, we don't have a lot of repair places anymore. It costs a fortune. Right. And, of course, the value of the cars are plunging. People are going to have a lot less equity in their car than the remaining payments on their mortgage. And so they end up not making the payments. Now you've got to repossess the cars. But there is a huge bubble. But interestingly enough, the first four months of 2015, this is the worst start to a year 
in auto sales since 2009. So wow. it looks to me like the air is coming out of the auto bubble already. We've already saturated the market. And so this is just the beginning uh, mm-hmm. of the decline. Yeah. Um, home mortgages, they're going longer now than uh, 30 years. There's longer home mortgages being offered, too, trying to keep that bubble inflated. Well, and of course, they're offering 3.5% down payments now, too, mm-hmm. with government guarantees, which was part of the problem, because 3.5% is not enough down to actually have skin in the game. It costs you more than that just to sell a house. So if you buy a house with 3.5% down, the minute your mortgage closes, you're already underwater. But the problem is now you're giving the homeowner you know, a free you know, gamble on, on the real estate market because if real estate prices go up, he can keep the profits, refinance. If prices go down, he could just walk away. But better than that, he could just stop making his payments altogether and live you know, rent-free for three years before they can kick you out. Uh, yeah. So that's really what they set up. And I think a lot of the recent home buyers that did put 3.5% down are going to do just that. They're just going to stop making their payments when they realize that they're underwater, especially when a lot of their repair bills come in, because a lot of people who are lulled into buying homes they couldn't afford, you know, once they see that it's not just the mortgage, but you also have maintenance uh, and property taxes, and some of these people might lose their jobs in this next recession. And so they no longer even have the income uh, to, to service. And a lot of these people, too, have adjustable rate mortgage. Imagine yeah. the people who they're not even taken out of thirty <laughs> With rates fixed. this low. Yes, they, they still buy an adjustable because rate they mortgage. couldn't afford the fixed rate. That's how stretched they are. You know, the real solution to the housing problem is to let real estate prices come down so right. that homes are affordable. But the government doesn't want to do that because it will bankrupt all the banks that loaned on them. So what their answer is is to keep prices inflated and just make credit available by keeping interest rates low and throwing the lending standards out the window, so that people can buy houses that they can't afford. Ben Bernanke recently commented on the savings glut. He doesn't think people are spending enough. And what's interesting is that when you uh, find out what uh, constitutes savings, paying down debt is not included in this calculation. So any currency that goes to that is considered savings Mm -hmm. for some reason. They consider paying down debt savings. Well, you reduce. Well, it's money you haven't spent. But I think when when Bernanke is talking about a savings glut, that they're paying for. Previous consumption, basically, right. when but, you pay down savings. Right, but when they're talking about the savings glut, they're referring to in other countries, not the United States. We have a savings shortage. There's maybe a glut of savings in, in, in Asia, for example. You know, but, but people look at that. Uh, I read an article recently about uh, that Chinese you know, have this big savings problem. Uh, you know, they, they have a bad habit of savings, like, you know, like smoking or something, as mm-hmm. if savings, right. savings is a virtue. That, you know, we're, but we're lecturing this Chinese, telling them, hey, you guys are saving too much. You need to spend more money. And one of the criticisms was that you know, they didn't have Social Security. Uh, they expected the Chinese to save for their own retirement. You know, imagine that, allowing people the freedom to save for their own retirement. And we basically said, no, China needs a gigantic Ponzi scheme run like by the government. They should adopt Social Security so that the Chinese people won't have to save anymore, as if savings are somehow undermining economic growth. But the only problem for China is that they're squandering their savings on U.S. treasuries. They're loaning the money to us, and we'll never pay it back. So that's a waste of their savings. They need to invest their savings productively in their own economy. And I think that is going to happen. And when it does, you know, the dollar is going to come crashing down. Yeah, I agree. And then the engineering of the entire economy and the illusion uh, this is interest rates from 1950 to today. And then uh, we have base money is the red line here. Mm-hmm. And then I plotted the uh, Wilshire 5000 total market cap index. So the mm-hmm. value of the 5000 largest companies in America. And what you see, I'll zoom in on this section here. Uh, you see that they took rates down to zero and at the same time created all this currency mm-hmm. and the correlation between currency creation and the markets Mm -hmm. is just mind-bogglingly close. It cannot possibly be an accident. Of course not. The markets, yeah. And that's why they can't raise rates. They can't raise rates without bursting that bubble. You know, to to not understand how these things are two are connected the way they are, it's one it's one causes the other. Mm -hmm. And I because I've heard people say, well, Peter, you know, we've had. 4%, 5% 4%, 5% interest rates in the past, so why can't we go back there now? I mean, what didn't create a problem then? Because we didn't have the enormity of the debt that we have now. We, we, you know, it's, it's one thing to have higher interest rates when you don't have a lot of debt. Sure, you can afford it. But when you're overwhelmed by debt, 
you can't afford it. And the other thing is when you've been on 0% for six years, yeah. you, you develop an addiction to that. We have built an, an entire economy around free money. You can't take that away. Right? You can, even if the interest rates are still low, even if they just went to 2 or 3%, mm -hmm. yes, that's still low, but not low enough for an economy addicted to 0%. Right? Right. If, like, if you're a heroin addict and your, your body is used to a certain amount of heroin, and then your pusher says, look, I can only give you half what I normally give you, but you still have some heroin, that's not going to cut it. Right? You're going to already start to go through withdrawal. You know, that's why the Fed, supposedly we've been in a recovery for six years, yet interest rates are still at zero. I mean, if, we, if it was a real recovery, they would have raised rates years ago. Yes, But right. they're afraid to do it because they know it's phony. But after a while, they had to at least talk about raising interest rates. They have to pretend that there's an exit strategy somewhere. But, you know, just like somebody who's overweight and talks about going on a diet in the future, they don't go on one yeah. in the present. So the, the Fed wants to maintain the ruse that, that they can raise rates by talking about their intention to raise rates. But they don't actually do it. And they play word games. They talk about, well, we're going to be patient or we're going to right. wait a considerable period. Or now they take away the word patient, but we're not impatient. You know, meanwhile, and now they're saying, well, we can't raise rates until unemployment improves. Well, I mean, it's been supposedly improving. The unemployment rate is five and a half percent. They initially said they would raise rates if it got to six and a half percent. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter where the unemployment rate goes, doesn't matter how high the inflation rate goes, they can never raise rates without precipitating a worse financial crisis than the one we had in 08. So you and I uh, just absolutely agree that this entire recovery has been engineered through the creation of currency. Uh, now, if Keynesian economics was remotely plausible, if it worked, would they have needed a QE2 or a QE3? Well, no, it would have worked the first time. Right. The reason they've done it three times is because it fails every time, which is why they're going to do a fourth, right? Mm -hmm. Quantitative easing is like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. Right? You, you can't put the fire out. You just make the fire bigger. But the problem is, you know, when all you have is gasoline, right, you, you don't, it, it, that's all you can do. And the, the Keynesians don't understand that their own remedy is the reason the patient is so sick. And they just want to keep on administering it. But I don't even think we've had a recovery. We haven't recovered from anything. We're sicker than ever. And the average American knows that. I mean, the man in the street can feel uh, his standard of living declining, uh, mm -hmm. despite what the Federal Reserve says. The cost of living is going up. The quality of jobs is going down. All the Fed is doing with its monetary policy is redirecting uh, resources from productive uses on Main Street to speculation on Wall Street. They're, yeah. they're propping up the stock market. They're propping up housing. They're diverting loans to things like education. They're propping up health care. But the real economy is, is, is disintegrating, and Americans can feel that. I mean, if we actually had a real recovery, uh, we wouldn't be talking about, you know, all the, the jobless recovery, right? Well, the right. reason it's jobless is because it's not a recovery. If it was a recovery, there would be good jobs. And the jobs that are being created, you know, I think the most interesting thing is who's getting them. Because they, they, they look at the, um, the uh, labor force participation rate, which is the lowest it's been uh, since the mid-1970s. And everybody wants to say, well, it's because the baby boom is retiring. So, hey, there's nothing we can do about it. We all know there's a baby boom. They're getting old. They must be retiring. That's why the labor force is shrinking. And a lot of people accept that on face value. Even Janet Yellen you know, be, be says that, right? But the reality is the baby boomers, the older people, they're the ones that are working in record numbers. You know, in fact, there are months when the only jobs that are created are for people 55 and older. It's the younger people, people in their 20s and 30s that are leaving the labor force. And what's happening is you've got so many Americans who were retired who have to come out of retirement and take a part-time job so they can pay their utility bills or they can put food on the table. That's where all the jobs are coming. And so the, the labor force participation is not about people retiring. The people who should be retiring can't afford to. And the younger people who should be working can't get jobs. That's the truth behind the numbers. Yeah. Um, the markets are in a bubble. I think that there's a crash coming. This is Dr. Robert Schiller's data. It's a little bit of a uh, confusing chart because it's got two data plots on it, into interest rates in red. But the valuation of the stock market uh, judged by P.E. ratios. And you see bubbles in 1901 and then undervalued in 21 and, and uh, overvalued during the peak of the, the 29 stock market bubble. And without exception, once it reaches a bubble, it bounces on the way down 
but it has to go to undervaluation before a new bull market can start. There was a mm -hmm. peak in 1966 of about 22, mm -hmm. uh, and then the peak in 2000, where uh, it was 40, you know, PE ratios over 45, which was absolute mm -hmm. insanity, and it started to bounce. It went down to uh, fair value. Uh, mm -hmm. but then bounced back up into a bubble here at 27. Mm -hmm. We're in an extreme bubble. Yeah. And, and so with know, these other indicators turning, do you think we're in for a stock market crash? Yeah, and I, I think, first of all, that it's actually worse than that because the earnings have been manufactured by share buybacks. Because interest rates have been so low, it's been easy for companies to buy back their shares. And mm -hmm. so now their earnings per share number can be higher because there's fewer shares. So they're not really driving the profitability. They're not driving the revenues. They're just shrinking the share base, but they are subjecting their shareholders. So the earnings per share yeah. look better. Right, but now they have all this debt. Right. But right now the interest rates are really low, so it's not hurting their earnings. But what happens when interest rates rise? And if they rise during a recession where their earnings are declining and they have no ability to pay the interest, a lot of these companies that were buying back shares might have to come back to the market and resell the shares to, to raise money to service or repay debt that they can no longer afford. Which so, will cause it to go way down to the greatest undervaluation in, undervaluation in history, I think. Right. So, but yeah. the reason I think there may not be a stock market crash, even though one is warranted, and in fact, it would be a healthy development rather than to mm -hmm. perpetuate the overvaluation and all the malinvestments that result from that. But I think this bubble is literally too big to pop. I think the Fed knows it. Again, that's why they've been talking about raising rates. And so you think rates. they'll uh, do more of this, the quantitative yeah. easing for? Right. Well, the way you stop the value of the stock market from plunging is make the value of the dollar plunge. And, and so rather than um, nominal prices declining, real prices decline. Right? So the real value of stocks, let's say measured in honest money like gold, plunges because the Fed is trying to prop everything up. They're trying to keep these bubbles from popping because mm -hmm. they're t literally too big to pop. They think the mistake that they made in 2008 was turning off the spigots. Right Now they want to keep them wide open. And so it's the dollar that's more likely to crash this time than the stock market. Yeah, I do think, though, that um, if uh, the problems first develop in other countries, like if the euro has a problem or uh, if, if China has a problem, uh, we could see the dollar go higher. It might not, but uh, I, I think that uh, we could see a short, very, very short-term deflation. That's something that the Fed can't control, and then they will overreact and print into potentially a hyperinflation. Well, I think we've already but seen the dollar rally. In fact, uh, there is probably more agreement mm -hmm. among traders, speculators, uh, in the dollar's direction. Everybody believes the dollar is going to go up. Everybody is long the dollar, yeah. betting on it continuing to rise, because everybody bought into this myth of a legitimate U.S. recovery, and they believed that the Fed was going to raise rates. So I doubt something that everybody expects to happen will, in fact, happen. What's going to surprise everybody is dollar weakness. Everybody is positioned mm -hmm. for dollar strength. And I think that trade is already over. I think the dollar is fully valued or overvalued based on this belief. And when everybody ultimately has to come to the conclusion that they were wrong, right, when the Fed is yeah. forced to admit that the economy is much weaker than they thought, and instead of a rate hike, we get QE4, I think the dollar collapses. And so I wouldn't want to hold out waiting for another dollar rally. I think we've already had it. And I think now the next thing for the dollar is a, a big drop. Um, the, the move that the dollar made was, uh, it's, it's less than a year, right? Yeah. Uh, now imagine if you're a, an importer or an exporter, what that's doing to your business. Mm -hmm. This whole thing of national currencies is just mm -hmm. a silly, stupid game that countries play mm -hmm. uh, that uh, hurts all of us. It hurts all of our prosperity. Um, a, a, an importer or an exporter that sees the cost of their goods change by 25% or the, the uh, price they're able to get for their goods going overseas by 25% in six months. This is something, you know, there's, if, you, if you charted out um, mm -hmm. the exchange rates, you could probably draw a line across it and say, my business will be successful when this is under here. And it'll, it'll go broke when, when the exchange rate is above a certain amount. Uh, uh, these, if we were using gold, all ex there wouldn't be any exchange rates, right? If, well, people, the if they trade, used honest yes. money all over the world, if, if honest money was the money that mm -hmm. we used in exchange. 
yes, it would certainly be a lot easier to do business, and we wouldn't have all these imbalances. The United States couldn't run these huge trade deficits if we had to pay for our imports with either exports or gold. Yeah. But when we can pay with them just by printing money, that costs nothing. Right. We can make an unlimited quantity of it. But this is going to end in disaster. I mean, this is something that's never been tried on a global scale. I mean, we have had uh, individual examples of fiat currencies being tried, you know, in one country or another, and it all always ends in disaster. You know, it never works, and countries always return to a gold standard. But what's unique about this time period, since you know we went off the gold standard in 1971, since the world was on a dollar standard, and when we went off the gold standard, we took the entire world off of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this has gone on for a while, but I think we're in the final stages of the world rejecting this monetary system where the dollar is at the center because it cannot work. Yeah, I do too. I I was, um, when I was writing my book, I uh, loaded it into a spreadsheet looking for cycles. Every currency crisis, stock market crash, uh, uh, bank panics or whatever, looking for some sort of cycle in there. And what mm-hmm. leapt out at me was that every 30 to 40 years, the world has a new monetary system. Yeah. And here we are like 43 years, 44 years, uh, going on 44, after uh, the end of the Bretton Woods being on this global dollar standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, I think the days are numbered uh, and that there is going to be a crisis and I think it's going to be soon. Yeah. Um, this is uh, uh, margin debt uh, mm-hmm. and the red line is just numeric, so the total amount of dollars of margin debt. But the mm-hmm. blue is margin debt compared to the GDP of the country, so the yeah. size of the economy. Mm-hmm. And uh, this chart is already a year old. Mm-hmm. But what you see is that every time it got over a certain percentage of the economy here, mm-hmm. there was a stock market crash right after uh, mm-hmm. it got up to those levels. And margin debt is back up to those mm-hmm. levels. And more importantly, though, too, the actual quality of our GDP has declined because so much of it is now just consumer spending financed by debt. Yeah. The real wealth producing components, you know, manufacturing, mining, things like that, you know, those parts of our economy have been contracting. So the, 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 the size of the GDP is very vulnerable to a collapse. That which would exacerbate those ratios, especially if there was an increase in interest rates. So we're certainly due for a stock market crash, but the economy is so vulnerable that it really can't withstand one anymore, which is why I think, again, the Federal Reserve is going to do everything it can to prevent that from happening. And there's only one thing they can do is printing money. But unfortunately, the ultimate consequence there is even worse because a dollar crash is going to be much more damaging to the U.S. economy and to the standard of living of the typical American than would a stock market crash or a real estate crash or a banking crisis. Mm -hmm. Uh, But unfortunately, the Fed doesn't care about that. It's just trying to delay the inevitable. It doesn't care how much worse it makes it during that time period because they're hoping that there'll be a different administration uh, in charge at the time. And, you know, they have no idea you know, how much time we have. So rather than face the music, they want to, you know, keep on playing. Right. Just keep on blowing that balloon up bigger and bigger. And every time it springs a leak, they slap a Band-Aid on it and keep on blowing more air in. Mm -hmm. Uh, For some reason, uh, you know, people get used to living in a bubble. They like it. And the uh, politicians want to... Well, some uh, people like it because there are some people that benefit from this process, but there's only a small sliver of the population. Uh, The overwhelming number is suffering, but they don't understand why. You know, you talk about now, you have this huge uh, growing chasm, you know, between the very rich and everybody else. You know, they Mm -hmm. call it, well, the 1%, uh, the 99%, but this this class warfare uh, is is, is being fueled by, you know, the very people that are creating it, and they don't even realize that it's their policies uh, that are doing it. It's the monetary policies that we have that are responsible for this widening divide. It's not capitalism that's doing it and just calling for higher taxes and more wealth distribution isn't going to solve the problem it's going to compound it we have to get to the source of what is driving this and it is the central bankers and their monetary policy and then to a lesser extent the regulatory and taxing policy of the u.s government absolutely agreed um the the gap between main street and wall street uh again it's engineered by all of this currency they created going into Wall Street and not to Main Street. And, and that's the reason wages haven't grown. Uh, this chart that John Hussman came up with, with where he took overvalued, uh, overbought, um, overbullish indicators and internals weakening, like uh, you know earnings uh, per share, and 
uh, added those factors together. And what was interesting is every time there's a major top, this uh, flashes uh, you know, up to very high levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 1987 stock market crash, it nailed that. And we've been getting uh, these alarms going off uh, mm-hmm. over and over again lately. That, and it may not. You might be right. Uh, the, the, the last time they started creating a, creating a lot of currency, Wall Street partied. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you did say that there's going to come a time uh, where um, they're going to start questioning the currency creation, that, that, uh, that you know, uh, it might be different this time. Uh, may, they might start partying on Wall Street first, but um, do you think that uh, even with massive currency creation, though, that, the, that people could say this really has, if they've got to do it again, mm-hmm. that means it really hasn't worked? Well, they have to come to that conclusion yet, right? I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. they didn't come to the conclusion with QE2 or 3, but I think there's been so much uh, anticipation and self-congratulations uh, by you know, the Fed and the, the Keynesian economists, you know, the Paul Krugmans of the world, uh, that when it doesn't work, when we're right back where we started with in fa- as far as back to recession, and if we've gone through the entirety of a business cycle and rates have been at zero the entire time, mm-hmm. People might start to realize, wait a minute, I mean, when can you ever raise rates? And if we're doing a QE4, and instead of the Fed's balance sheet shrinking from the current four and a half trillion, we have to expand it to six, seven trillion, the idea that it's ever going to go back down again, people are going to see that, you know, for the ruse that it is. And I do think there's going to be a loss of confidence. I mean, why anybody still has confidence in the Fed is beyond me. Uh, But I think uh, that confidence is going to go away. And, and when it does, you know, you've, you know, you've destroyed the value of the currency. And I think that as the world tries to shun dollar-denominated debt, because the rates have to stay low. We can't raise interest rates to make the dollar attractive because we can't afford to pay those rates. So we have to keep the rates artificially low. We can only do that by creating more money. But the yeah. more money we create, the less it's worth and you know, the, the, the fewer people who actually want it. So then you have a situation where the Federal Reserve has to expand its QE program, not just to mortgages and, and, and treasuries, but to corporate bonds, to municipal bonds. They have to start buying everything. They become the buyer of only resort. And then the dollar really you know, has a crisis. And now the Fed is in a position. And how, you know, <clears throat> you know. how moral is that, that uh, uh, there's an entity that gets to create currency that is going to become the buyer of everything? And they're creating the currency to do it. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's not moral at all. It's theft is what it is. Theft. But uh, eventually people aren't going to want to be stolen from, and they're right. going to rebel against that currency, and they're going to look for a safe haven, something like gold, where they can protect themselves uh, from, from really this monetary looting. Yeah. Um, most people don't realize that we're in this grand experiment, that the Keynesians that run things don't actually know what they're doing because this has never been done at this Well, the level irony, though, before. is it's not an experiment because we know how it's going to end. There's no chance that this can work because history is replete with examples, again, on a smaller scale. A smaller scale, yeah. But if it doesn't work on a small scale, just putting it on a bigger scale doesn't change the outcome. It maybe changes it makes the dynamics. The, out, the, the yeah. same outcome, but yeah. much bigger to yeah. match the uh, energy yeah. that so was put So the people into who it. say this is some kind of experiment, yeah. they're wrong. They, they haven't learned anything. We don't have to experiment. We have history. We can learn from the mistakes of the past. The problem is our central bankers and our uh, economists never learn from the mistakes of the well, t- what I past. Mean they repeat them all. Is from their point, uh, mm-hmm. they they think that they've they've got these little models that yeah. that say if you do this, this will happen, and yeah. if you do, but uh, they don't know yeah. that they actually can't control it. They can influence mm-hmm. stuff short term. Yeah, they uh, think that they've they think that you right. know, this time it's different, or they can tweak it a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's like somebody having another communist revolution say, oh, we're going to get it right. You know, uh, the, 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 the Soviets didn't get it right or the Chinese didn't get it, or, you know, it, you know, the Cubans or the North Koreans, wherever it's been tried, you know, we're going to try it again. We're going to have it. You don't have to try communism again. It's failed. Right. Right. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter how you want to repackage it. It's never going to work. But everybody thinks they're smart enough that they can make it work. And so you've got people now that think, yeah, we can make this work. Yes, it, it didn't work in the past, but we're so smart that it's going to work now. And it's not going to work. It's going to sp- fail even more spectacularly because it's even bigger. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we were talking about home ownership a little bit earlier. So uh, this is a chart that goes back to 1980. It's the levels of home ownership have dropped back down 
to 64%. It hit 69% during the peak of the real estate bubble. Uh, yeah. what's, what's your... Well, first of all, it's going to go lower. But yes. it really, you're really graphing the disintegration of the middle class uh, who can no longer afford, thanks to the government, to buy homes. And you had all these government programs designed to make home ownership more affordable. And, of course, like everything the government does, it backfires. And it's now made home ownership less affordable and less desirable. So you have record numbers of people who are now renting their houses from hedge funds and private equity funds. And you know what's been happening to rents for the past few years? They've been rising four, five, six percent a year, more, 10 percent in some areas, uh, because people have no choice now uh, but to rent. And those rents don't even make it into the CPI because they use something like owner's equivalent rent. And for some reason, that never goes up. But the actual rent that people are paying is going up. That's why I mentioned that right now uh, you have uh, 25 percent of renters have to spend half their income on their housing costs which is up considerably from where it was in 2007, right, before the Great Recession started. I mean, the old rule of thumb used to be that, you know, housing costs should make up no more than maybe a quarter of your income. Mm -hmm. And now yeah, people are devoting half their third, income. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, everything else is getting more expensive. You know, food right. is getting more expensive. Health care is getting more expensive. Uh, utility bills. I mean, the only lifeline that a lot of Americans had is that gas prices came down. Gasoline got less expensive, but that's already changing. Oil prices are headed back up. And, you know, people are wondering, hey, where was the benefit that we got? You know, because we didn't see it in retail sales uh, from the lower gas prices. And there was a benefit. It's just that there were so many other problems that you couldn't see it because the consumer was drowning. And, okay, now he's got a lifeline here, and, uh, but you couldn't see it. It wasn't like they were spending the extra money. They needed the extra money for food. Right. But now that lifeline is being yanked away because gas prices are going back up. And so this will go lower, the home Absolutely. ownership. Yeah, yeah as you, because you, know, you need to eat. You, know, you, need, you, know, you need energy. There's certain things you have to buy. That figure oh. of 50% to yeah. put, a price, put a roof over your head, yeah. this is a, a, the, the percentage of your income uh, going to home ownership or rent uh, to put that roof over your head, that's pretty much a constant that you can trace back to like oh, yeah. ancient Roman times. <laughs> you can only afford a certain percentage of your income, and you can see when something's in a bubble because it's at or, or beyond mm. a certain extreme. And think about this, and, Mike, because this is the cost of home ownership with interest rates at record lows. The Fed's got rates at zero. Yeah, so, so there's nowhere to go. There, it's never been cheaper to borrow money. You know, back in the day in the, in the 80s, people were buying houses with 12% mortgages, 14% right. second mortgages carried back by the seller. I mean, how could, it, how could we have afforded that? Can you imagine how much wealthier Americans used to be in the past when they can buy a house, put 20% down, and then pay 12% mortgage on the remaining 80%? Now, Americans are so broke, they can barely scrape up 3.5% with a 2.5% adjustable rate mortgage. So, you know, you imagine where home prices would have to go, where their home ownership would have to go, if we just had a return to low interest rates, not, just, not zero, just historically low, right, right. you know, or if people were requiring a down payment again, you know. So this is with all the artificial Yeah, real estate supports. would definitely crash. Of course, uh, either the prices it, it, would crash or yeah. nobody would be owning homes. They would exactly. all be owned by hedge funds. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, levels of margin debt, we'll skip that. Uh, this is these blue. These are different countries here, and all of these countries are in Europe. The blue here is different durations of their bonds that are in negative interest rate territory, where you have to pay to loan the country your currency. Yeah, it shows you how <laughs> absurd this is. And right, right, that old expression, "Whom the gods would destroy, they they first make mad." Right. Well, you can see that we're on the eve of destruction when the world is this crazy right. that you would actually pay somebody money. To pay them, to them the borrow when you, yeah. they have the use of your money and you get back less, right? I'm going to buy a bond for a thousand dollars, knowing that I'm only going to get nine hundred ninety nine back. I mean, what is the purpose of doing that? But you know, it's actually worse than that because I do believe that there are a lot of countries where their CPI is not really accurately measuring uh, what's really going on with the cost of living. So there probably are a lot of other countries that have negative rates. I think so America... So when you apply real rates to yeah, it, you I think, think, I think much we, of the world is upside down. Yeah, now. I think the United States has negative rates. I mean, we, don't, uh -huh. we, we say, oh, we have 2% interest rates or for a 10-year bond, but our inflation is only a half a percent. I think our inflation rate is more than 
I don't think the government statistics reflect how bad it really is. Right. I don't so, believe so either. I so call I it think the CP we have. Lie. Yeah, we, we, we've got <laughs> negative rates. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that there's actually negative nominal rates, where you know, again, you buy a bond for a thousand euros and you only get nine hundred ninety something euros when it matures. You know, or even the interest that you make along the way when you add it to what you get back is still less than you originally loaned. Right. You know, because now because this has now, never happened before yeah. in human history. Because it shows and you, so it, you're, you're, yeah. we're running out of rope here. And now, because people are saying, well, why should I buy that bond? I'm just going to hold on to cash. You know, and now, and, and if the bank deposits has a negative rate, well, why even put my money in the bank? I mean, why don't I just put it in my mattress? You know, now putting money under the mattress seems like it's a more responsible thing to do yeah. than loan it to a bank at a negative rate of interest. Because the bank could fail and you've lost your money. You might, why take a risk if you're not going to be paid? Right. So this is where and we've it's, gone. It's illegal to put uh, cash in a safe deposit box. In I know. Bank. Well, some of these countries and want to make it even illegal to have cash. Yeah. And they're, in, they're cracking down on people who are even conducting their business in cash, which is, you know, the, the way around that, of course, is own gold, right? Own right. real money. Yeah. You know, if they're going to start punish you for owning euros or owning yen or maybe owning dollars, well, okay, don't own it, you know. You know, own, 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 uh, own something real. Yeah, that's uh, what I do. I've, uh, my uh, total net worth is split up between mm. uh, cash. Uh, it's, it's vast majority is mm. physical gold and silver. Now we're going to talk about what you can do to protect yourself in this environment. And Peter had some, uh, we were talking about gold potentially basing here. Well, I think it's been building this base now for a couple of years. And you'll notice, you know, every time we get down below 1,200, uh, people start saying, this is it. You know, it's going to collapse. Gold's going below 1,000.